<coughs> okay, so thanks a lot uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity of uh, talking about subjects that uh, I find uh, interesting. Uh, so, uh, from uh, the discussions I had, uh, I so I tried to uh, to put the level of the talk uh, in a way that would be suitable for uh, at least uh, I would say. Uh, uh, graduate students and non-specialists. Uh, I want to <coughs> uh, apologize also for the fact that at some point in the presentation I'll switch to the board because my recent um, intense uh, babysitting activities uh, did not uh, allow me to uh, to finish all the slides uh, or at least as well as I wanted but uh, actually it's a pretty nice thing that at some point we are allowed to switch on the board. Okay, so the topic I would like to present, uh, to be honest, is not of applied nature, okay? It's more of uh, the mathematics of some uh, restricted aspects of machine learning that uh, have uh, been uh, around for some while. And uh, the main thing I'll try to emphasize is the, the fact that uh, three topics uh, of apparently uh, quite different nature uh, statistical learning, the theory of empirical processes, and uh, some aspects of combinatorics actually share a very tight uh, link uh, or uh, interact in a very interesting way. <coughs> and uh, we'll try uh, to uh, make these uh, connections clear. Okay, so uh, these are the four uh, talks I'd like to discuss. So uh, first introduction uh, about learning that will be motivating the material presented next. Uh, the second part, empirical processes, will uh, recall some, uh, well, I would say today uh, very well established and known facts uh, about uh, a theory that naturally applies to statistical learning in some specific context. And then I'll talk about vatnik shervonenkis combinatorics, which uh, also is well established, but some recent, uh, I would say, uh, some more recent uh, refinements of the theory uh, allow to uh, to still be uh, a, a modern uh, topic. And in the fourth, fourth part uh, that I call the outlook, I'd like to discuss about some of the main hypotheses and some of the main um, problems discussed uh, in the three first parts and how uh, it seems like the research community is uh, changing and towards which new uh, formulations of the problem uh, machine learning is moving from, I mean, I mean in, in, in my uh, community at least, uh, especially I'll talk about uh, online questions in online learning. Okay, so the, I apologize if uh, what I'm going to say is uh, too basic for people in the audience, uh, but uh, uh, well, please uh, don't hesitate to, to mention if all, everything I'm saying is uh, it's obvious, but I, I try to, to talk to non-specialists and therefore uh, define a lot of well-known stuff. So the subject of the talk is, uh, I mean, motivated at least by supervised learning and uh, with a focus on the natural uh, method called empirical risk minimization. And we'll try to address the questions. So what is this uh, learning technique? How does it work? When does it work well? And when it doesn't, uh, which algorithm works better? So unfortunately, in the way I I think the work is going to go. I don't think we'll have a lot of time to discuss the last item, uh, which is, I mean, probably a very interesting one, but at least we'll uh, cover in details uh, the three first parts. Okay, so obviously uh, the, the problem of uh, supervised learning is one that applies in many applications that uh, I, uh, I'm quite certain most of you are very familiar with. For instance, uh, if I give you a family of uh, letters, handwritten letters labeled with, uh, I mean, if you know that, that you have a, the first row are zeros, second row ones, etc. If I, and now if I give you a new handwritten digit, uh, are you able with these examples to uh, construct a, a, a method to identify the new digit automatically? This question, of course, applies also to questions in, speak, in a speech recognition. If, uh, I take a thousand of uh, people to whom I each ask to pronounce the word goat or the word boat. And now if I take a, a new person, if I ask him to pronounce a word, if I, am I able to distinguish 
if this word, or I distinguish automatically if this word was goat or boat. Okay, so the same applies for weather forecast. So this um, probably not as uh, satisfactorily. This is something we can discuss at the end. Uh, okay, but so from, from a more formal point of view, uh, the general problem of prediction can be stated in this naive uh, way. Uh, given a random pair of uh, x and y's, okay, of x, y, sorry, x being thought of uh, as an input variable and y as a, a label, okay, or a characteristic of, uh, of the phenomenon described by the observation x. And for simplicity, I'll uh, so I have a pointer somewhere if I'm able to find it. Okay. So for simplicity, we'll restrict to the case where y is uh, take values in some script y, which is in minus 1, 1, OK, for simplicity. Uh, so the naive question at this level, of course, is how to predict uh, y given x in the best possible way. So of course, this question is very, well, uh, very uh, ill posed. I mean, it's uh, not correctly defined, because I need to, to understand what I mean by best. But uh, this is naturally done. By introducing, I mean, it depends on your objective, a so-called loss function, whose goal is to uh, assess, given uh, an observation, uh, a label y, how much do I, uh, how do I measure the, the performance of y prime as a prediction for y? Well, by this value of the loss function that takes positive values. And since, of course, I observe uh, random uh, points uh, for consistency of my method, I want my uh, method to perform, um, I want to be able to evaluate the performance of a function uh, h, say, uh, on average over the, the points x, y, which are drawn from my random variable x uh, and y. I simply uh, naturally uh, average the value of this loss over the pairs x, y, which are drawn from the distribution p, okay? So uh, this, now that this uh, object is well defined, uh, a more natural question and well-defined question this time is what is the smallest possible value of the risk and uh, which functions achieve a small risk? So note that for, for the moment, of course, I, I do not, this is a theoretical question, okay, I'm not introducing any questions uh, of statistical nature here, I'm just asking this question uh, in a mathematical way. I mean, suppose you know the distribution of xy, what is the best possible function you can come up with? if I fix a value of the function, if I fix the loss function L. So, uh, so okay, so two more uh, definitions that I'll be using uh, sometimes. So recall this definition of the risk of a given function, uh, H uh, N uh, associated to a loss function L, and simply the, what we'll call the optimal risk is the smallest possible value of the risk achieved on all possible functions from uh, RD to Y. And uh, a function h star will simply be uh, called an optimal predictor if it achieves the smallest value, smallest possible value of the risk. Okay. So two, uh, I mean, I would say arch archetypal examples of uh, uh, prediction problems are the least squares regression problem, where uh, so this case so x takes so values in R D for simplicity. Uh, y uh, takes continuous value, say, in minus 1, 1. And if I fix the loss function L to be this uh, so-called square loss, uh, so first the risk takes this specific form, and it's a well-known uh, fact that the best, the, the function, uh, or achieving the best possible value of the risk, smallest possible value of the risk, is the expectation, conditional expectation of Y given X. Okay. So in this case, you know what is uh, the smallest risk, and it's achieved by this function specifically. You have a closed form for the, for the solution of this problem. So another archetypal problem, of course, is uh, the binary classification problem, where in uh, this case, uh, you suppose that the value y takes only two possible values, minus 1 or 1. So a more appropriate uh, value of the loss, uh, in this case, is the so-called binary loss, which is just one if you make a mistake, and zero otherwise. And in this case, the risk uh, of a function h is simply the probability that uh, 
predicting uh, y by h of x, you make an error, and that's it. And in this case, you also have a closed form for the solution uh, or for the optimal, uh, uh, you have a closed form for the optimal predictor, and it's uh, this time the sign of the regression function, which is here, okay? The sign meaning uh, plus one if r of x is larger than zero, and uh, minus one if it's strictly smaller than zero. Okay, so this is very nice. Uh, this is, I mean, purely mathematical. And uh, from the point of view of applications, it has a quite limited interest because, I mean, in practice, if you come back uh, to the two examples we discussed here, I mean, computing these guys, which are the regression function or the sign of the regression function, these guys are, of course, depending on the distribution of the data, which, of course, usually from a statistical point of view is unknown. And in practice, the only thing which is available to you is uh, a sample, okay, uh, a collection of random, bar of random couples, uh, entry uh, label, entry label, which, okay, so this is a big assumption. Uh, you suppose these observations to be independent and identically distributed with same distribution P as uh, this generic random couple that I considered so far. And uh, in this setting, uh, a way to rephrase the problem or to be a bit less ambitious given the fact that you have a bit less information than the full probability p, you just have some observations uh, drawn from this uh, unknown probability measure. What you could ask, and a reasonable um, one way to phrase the learning problem in this context, one possible way, you have other ways to phrase it, but one way to phrase it is to say, okay, so now suppose I fix a so-called hypothesis class. Okay, so, so this is a family of functions that I fix. They are known to me as a, a user, say. And now can I construct uh, a function h hat using only the learning sample and the hypothesis class that does as good as the best function in h. So as good uh, has to be defined properly. Um, and what I mean by as good, so I'm just repeating uh, notations here. So uh, as by as good, I mean, uh, is it possible to, to construct a function h hat using only the sample and my hypothesis class? Uh, that achieves a value of the risk, okay, uh, which is uh, close to the smallest possible value of the risk in this uh, benchmark class h. Okay, uh, so the question uh, is uh, positive, and, uh, the, but still uh, we have to answer this question. I mean, the, the, the fundamental question at this point is uh, what are the available uh, methods to construct such a function h hat? Okay, so, uh, so very crude and uh, general, I mean, not crude, a uh, very general way to to uh, actually formalize this idea of constructing uh, such, um, such prediction predictors is the, the, the idea of prediction algorithm. Uh, and what is a prediction algorithm? So the, you could phrase uh, or define formally a prediction algorithm as follows. So uh, remember that uh, you fix a function h, okay, a hypothesis class, and you want, uh, your goal is to do as well as the best function in this class. Uh, so in this setting, uh, what is called an algorithm is, uh, say, given a function, uh, function class G, which possibly is different than, than H. Uh, we'll discuss why next. Uh, uh, what is called a deterministic prediction algorithm is a function that uh, takes a family of, so here the points X and Y are deterministic, they don't need to be random. Okay, the, so to any collection of uh, observations label, observation label, okay, so labeled observations, uh, associates a, a function in G. Okay, so this, uh, this guy denotes a function. It's not just a number, it's a function. Okay, and there's a, so this term randomizable is not a standard, so I just use it here because I didn't have any uh, better word uh, at the time, but uh, so by randomizable, I mean that it's um, a form of algorithm that is uh, uh, that opens the possibility to randomization, which is sometimes necessary to be ro robust to 
to some kind of adversarial effects, people that are trying to make you uh, fail in your prediction task. So sometimes you need this, but uh, I'm not sure we'll be in a situation we'll, in this talk where we talk much about this, but simply a modification where in, in addition to a collection of labeled uh, observations, the algorithm uh, has the, the possibility to take a, an input Z, which might be a random variable. And again, the output of the algorithm is uh, a function in G. So uh, before we move to examples, uh, so what is a, a predictor in this uh, setting? So a predictor given, a, given now an algorithm, which is, a, so say for the moment, a deterministic algorithm. Uh, the associated predictor is simply a, a function from Rd to Y, which is defined in this way. So you see that it's an algorithm applied to the sample. So this sample is now random. That you apply to a given X, and this, this is a your prediction of y, given your sample. And the randomized predictor would be simply the same object where z is some independent random variable uh, that allows for some robustness properties, but we'll, we'll not m talk much about this. So just uh, two examples, very famous examples. So of course, the first, uh, the first family, uh, I would say, of uh, methods are uh, so focus on the prediction rather than the representation of the, the output of the algorithm. So what I mean by this is that some, um, some uh, prediction strategies or algorithms are such that it's very hard to picture the kind of function, functions it produces, and this is typical of the k-nearest neighbor algorithm. So uh, the, the, this algorithm in itself in this talk is not very uh, I mean, uh, apropos, or it's not extremely um, interesting for the subject of our talk. What is in interesting in this uh, example is that uh, the, k the k means the k nearest neighbor, sorry, algorithm produces a function which is very hard to picture, and uh, in particular the function g, which was uh, in the previous uh, definition of an algorithm, is uh, in this case very hard to picture. In particular, you'll have a hard time trying to. Uh, uh, represent uh, the output of uh, this algorithm. Well, this is not a big uh, deal, but okay, so what does the k nearest neighbor algorithm do? Uh, so for a value of k smaller than your sample size n, uh, it simply uh, outputs uh, given x, okay, it outputs the, the weighted average of the y's, uh, which are associated to x's, which lie in the k nearest neighbors of this, uh, of this uh, target x. So it's a very natural uh, way to do. I mean, you select the points uh, in the neighborhood of the points that you want to uh, affect the label to. And you, uh, in this uh, close neighbors of this point, you just average the labels and, with the, and give them a, a, a weight to the labels, which is uniform over these neighbors. OK. so. Something we'll be more focusing on in this talk is this uh, family of algorithms, which in this case now, uh, contrary to the, the, the k-nearest algorithm, is extremely, uh, is not constructive, but in, in a, uh, in a, but in an, another, in a, I mean, it's not constructive, but it has the, the nice uh, feature of uh, uh, being uh, friendly in terms of representation of the function it outputs. So what I mean by this is simply that uh, if you fix a hypothesis class H, the least squares algorithm is defined uh, in a way that, uh, okay, so it doesn't define very well because you might have to choose a function that reaches the minimum in the least squares criterion. You might, be, you might have several, uh, several functions reaching the minimum. Uh, but, uh, well, you understand what I mean? So I give you x1 and y1, xn, yn. Uh, a function class H, and I want you to, the algorithm is asked to output the function H in this class, which minimizes this, uh, this sum of squares, okay? And here, uh, you see that every function outputted by the algorithm is by, constructed, by construction equal to H. Okay, so, uh, so more generally, uh, what is empirical risk minimization? Uh, so empirical risk minimization exactly is exactly the same uh, 
the same procedure where you see the only difference with the previous slide is that, of course, it applies for any possible loss function, not necessarily the square loss, but any, any loss function. Okay. Uh, in other words, uh, the predictor uh, that you output uh, or constructed from this algorithm is just a function, so it's a random function, of course, in the, in the class H that satisfies this, uh, this equality, okay? I suppose, uh, I'm sweeping under the carpet uh, technical questions such as, uh, is this minimum achieved? Uh, okay, so of course, this can be easily modified by introducing epsilon minimizers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I will also, unfortunately, because it's a very interesting question, but sweep under the carpet uh, more uh, uh, practical questions such as how to compute H in practice. Okay, so, so this is a, an important field uh, of investigation which is related to optimization, but uh, I will sweep this under the carpet for uh, the time being. Okay, so I just want to mention, because uh, I believe in a, a general talk on the subject, it might be interesting to, to mention some sig significant personalities in the field that I uh, am interested in. So first I want to talk about uh, Frank uh, Rosenblatt, which is uh, rightfully understood as maybe one of the guys who started uh, machine learning with uh, the perceptron. So I, th I think it's him on the right hand side, I'm not sure, but uh, I believe it's him working on a, an implementation of uh, this perceptron, which is uh, one instance actually of, uh, could be understood as one of the first insta instances of uh, empirical risk minimization and uh, the beginning also of neural networks. Uh, of course, uh, Vladimir Vapnik and Alexei Chervonenkis are today well understood as people who probably some of the first people who gave very strong theoretical foundations to uh, the aspects of learning theory I'll be talking about today. Uh, Leslie Valiant is uh, somebody who introduces uh, the PAC model, which is uh, PAC stands for probably approximately correct and is understood as, as one of the people who connected uh, theoretical questions of learning theory to computational complexity aspects. And uh, somebody called David Hostler, who contributed to connect uh, the theory of uh, Vapnik and Chavonenkis to computational learning theory. And uh, so a funny fact about this guy that I actually learned uh, a few days ago uh, while preparing this uh, speech. Uh, this is why I say uh, not only DNA, because actually uh, it appears that this guy who I believe was a hardcore mathematician is actually mu much well known, much better known for his contribution to uh, genome sequencing, human genome sequencing. He's uh, apparently, he's, uh, uh, I mean, his contribution, uh, he's been in one of the first team who contributed in uh, uh, completing the uh, human genome sequence, uh, sequencing. And so actually his work is more involved in computational biology than mathematics. But I mean, what he did is pretty impressive in the field anyway. And of course, I'm, I'm forgetting many people, <coughs> and I, I, uh, I apologize if I uh, uh, forgot some unforgettable people, but, well, this is the selection I did. <laughs> okay, so now I want to talk about empirical processes and uh, why they are a very natural uh, object that arise when uh, wanting to, to study the, uh, the performance of empirical risk minimization. And at this, at, this, uh, at this point, unfortunately, I have to switch to the blackboard. Okay, so <clears throat> before connecting uh, the area of empirical processes to uh, the study of uh, empirical risk minimization, I'd like to give uh, some very basic uh, definitions. So uh, throughout this uh, second part, so you can for the moment put aside what we discussed so far. Uh, I'll just consider S to be uh, some, uh, some, some set, okay? P will be uh, some probability measure on S. 
and I'll consider uh, uh, a sample, so Z1, Zn, which will be uh, random variables, which I'll suppose uh, independent with same distribution P. Okay. And uh, from which we can construct uh, the so-called uh, empirical distribution so which in, in, fa in fancy terms can be written uh, as the sum of uh, Dirac masses in the random points Zi uh, but uh, a more uh, user-friendly way to understand it is that for any set uh, is to write that for any set A, so P n of a set A is defined as 1 divided by n sum i equals 1 to n indicator function of A applied to Zi, so it counts or it's the average uh, sorry, it's the yes, it's it's the average uh, number of zi's which uh, which uh, fall in the set uh, A. And more generally, if you take a function f uh, from s, uh, so in zero one, say, okay, to avoid uh, uh, existence of uh, questions of integrals, uh, the integral of f with respect to to Pn is simply defined as 1 divided by n sum for 1 i equals 1 to n f of zi. Okay? So um, it should be understood the way that Pn should be understood, of course, is uh, as the best possible or at least one good approximation of the probability measure P if, uh, if the only knowledge you have about P is just a simple Z1, Zn, okay? So if you do not know P and I give you Z1, Zn and I'm asking you can you reconstruct the underlying distribution P, well, a good choice is to select this, uh, this uh, value uh, Pn. And uh, motivation, uh, of course, uh, a good motivation for choosing this is that uh, obviously uh, by the law of uh, large numbers, for instance, well, uh, the integral of uh, any function f, uh, okay, bounded, say, uh, with respect to Pn tends uh, almost surely towards the integral of f with respect to P. So, in a sense, this uh, is a, a valid approximation of Pn. Uh, and, uh, and, and has a natural uh, interest uh, from a point of view of, of statistics. Uh, no, uh, because f, the integral of f uh, respect to Pn, it's a random quantity because it depends on, on the Zi's. So, uh, <coughs> okay, so, uh, so what is the empirical, uh, so, now given a, so what is called the empirical process, Okay, so fix uh, a family of functions so uh, for simplicity I'll, I'll take functions take uh, bounded by one okay because to avoid existence uh, issues so I fix a class of functions okay and uh, I denote uh, g n uh, of f uh, uh, the quantity which is the integral of f with respect to p minus the integral of f with respect to pn uh, for f uh, in, uh, okay, so simply this is a definition and uh, what is called the empirical process indexed uh, by f is uh, this, uh, this, this process. Okay, so you see that this, this is uh, something that takes values in, uh, 
So this takes values uh, <laughs> zero uh, in the interval. So okay. So this integral since f is in zero one takes values in zero one. This also. So basically, this is. Uh, uh, a quantity that takes values in minus one, one. And uh, you can see this as a, a sequence or a family indexed by the functions in this uh, class, okay? So, um, so how does this relate to uh, uh, empirical risk minim minimization? So, of course, the question how does it relates to ERM. So ERM stands for empirical risk minimization. So, um, so by a very simple uh, observation, so empirical risk minimization that uh, I've introduced uh, in the first part, okay, uh, reduces basically to solve the so optimization problem, which is okay, so to solve this this uh, this problem. So in a very uh, I mean in a fancy way because uh, the class <coughs> in our context the class uh, F uh, so, uh, so if you have a look, uh, Okay, so it, uh, it solves, it, it, it boils down to solving this optimization problem with a very specific choice for the function class f, uh, which is basically constructing from your so-called loss functional. Uh, here you take functions h in this hypothesis class h, blah, blah, blah. But actually, uh, for everything I'll be discussing next, the specific structure of the function, uh, of the function class f, which appears in Empirical risk uh, minimization kind of blurs the, more, the, the, the important aspects of the question, which I believe are much, appear much clearly if you consider this simple problem, in a sense. I just give you class F, uh, an unknown probability measure P. Can you solve this problem given a sample? Uh, so, uh, of course, as you can see, uh, if you don't know uh, the value of P, so given uh, only Uh, so p, uh, supposing p unknown, okay. Uh, so I want to say that the best you can do is to solve. Uh, it's not. It's maybe not the best. So, but I, at least what you can do is you can solve the analog problem where you replace the unknown uh, probability Pn by okay, the empirical analog, uh, okay, which is uh, the empirical measure that you can construct as soon as you are given, uh, as soon as you are given um, data. Okay? So you can uh, solve uh, this problem and actually find some f hat which uh, minimizes uh, This, uh, this criterion that you can compute, okay? So uh, now, uh, remains to evaluate the performance of uh, this f hat. And uh, this performance, uh, so uh, 
can be precisely measured by this quantity. As in any optimization problem, you, you compare the, the value of uh, the, the solution you found okay, to the optimization problem, and you compare it to the best possible value from at least a theoretical point of view. And uh, so this, in the learning setting, this is exactly, uh, so I put it with uh, some tags to say that uh, this is what would be the risk of your empirical risk minimizer in the context of learning theory compared to the best possible value of the risk. So this is the, the way the, the most natural way to measure the performance of uh, a predictor compared to the best possible, uh, oh, sorry, this is just the best way to measure the performance of a predictor. Uh, so it happens that this, uh, this uh, criterion is uh, upper bounded by uh, the supremum for f in the class f of the empirical process over there, fn minus f bar. So this f bar is not a real, uh, real interest, but I just uh, introduce it for, uh, for correctness, where f is any uh, function or achieving the, the best possible value of uh, this quantity, okay? So you see that, uh, so to answer this question, how does it relate to ERM? The supremum of uh, empirical processes, which is here, appears as a very natural object uh, to control the performance of uh, empirical risk minimizers. So the next question now is how does uh, how does this supremum of empirical processes behave? Okay, so I want to talk about a fundamental observation uh, in this precise problem, which was, uh, which so derives from ideas from uh, from Vapnik and Chervonenkis in the in the seventies and more um, and maybe more in a more slightly more elaborate way by Guinée and Zin in uh, 84 and which is called the symmetrization principle and uh, the symmetrization principle states that in a simple a simple setting so introduce Independent random signs. So, what I mean by random signs is simply that for any value of i, uh, sig the sigma i's are independent random variables that take value plus or minus one with probability one half. Okay, so it's coin flips. Uh, then it happens that the expectation of the supremum of this uh, 
empirical process over there, okay, can be controlled by uh, okay, two times the expectation of a, a kind of intriguing quantity if you are not used to, to it. Okay, that's it. So you can control independently. This does, uh, I insist on the fact that this absolutely does not depend on the unknown distribution probability P, okay? Or on the function class F, okay? This is always true. And I insist on the fact that these are random variables, okay? Mm -hmm. Which I will suppose and is supposed independent of these ones, okay? So this quantity on the right-hand side here is uh, a measure of complexity of uh, the class F, which is uh, usually uh, referred to as the Radmacher complexity. Of, of F. Okay, so uh, there are fancy ways to convince yourself that this is a, uh, a natural, or a natural, uh, probably not natural at first sight, uh, would be kind of a, uh, I mean, sometimes mathematicians, when they spend a lot of time with uh, their favorite uh, objects, they always say it's natural, natural, but uh, actually in this case, uh, there's good reasons to, to understand why this quantity is a, a way uh, to measure the complexity or the richness of uh, this class F. And remember that, morally speaking, uh, if you come back to, uh, to empirical risk minimization, uh, our class F is, uh, relates to our class of hypothesis functions, the, the functions, the candidate functions we're considering for prediction. So, of course, uh, the larger the class, uh, the better in a sense, but this, I mean, you have to measure at some point uh, how complicated is the class in which you're gonna run some uh, algorithmic procedures. And this is one uh, way to measure it and is often uh, considered in the literature. And, uh, and, um, and the rest of the talk, I'll denote this by a bold, uh, bold R of F. Okay, so uh, so far, what we have simply uh, showed is that uh, if uh, if f hat f uh, minimizes okay, this uh, data dependent uh, quantity on the right hand side, then the performance of f as an approximation to the uh, the, the an analog quantity depending on the unknown distribution is uh, up to a universal constant, okay, up bounded by uh, or the expectation of this guy, sorry, is uh, up bounded by this uh, so-called Radmacher complexity of F. So, uh, so far it doesn't seem that we, we moved uh, in an interesting direction. I mean, we just transformed the problem a little bit, but uh, nothing seems to come Nothing really interesting uh, comes out of it for the moment. Uh, the next question now is how to assess okay how to assess this uh, Radmacher complexity, so-called, uh, and this is where uh, two interesting aspects. 
come into play is that um, so so it's not it will not appear very clearly why it's a combinatorial problem a priori but we'll try at le uh, actually to move towards this direction and uh, to establish in precise terms the connection. So before talking about combinatorial aspects, uh, I, I need to uh, introduce uh, some, um, some new uh, concept. So this idea of covering numbers, uh, usually attributed to I think it's in 50, 59. Uh, so it's usually attributed to uh, Kolmogorov and Tikhomirov. Uh, so it's a pretty old uh, object that was introduced in a completely different framework, uh, the framework of uh, approximation theory and uh, in analysis. So people were not a priori at all interest, interested in uh, stati statistics at this level. Um, and uh, so the notion of covering number can be defined in a very uh, general setup of metric spaces and stuff. But uh, let's uh, try to uh, introduce it in a framework which is related to ours. So just uh, for a given probability measure, on this set S on which we're working. Uh, so before giving any, uh, I want to maybe give a, a word on why we need to understand uh, covering numbers. So uh, there's something which is, uh, there are quite uh, easy ways to, to handle this uh, quantity when the, the function f uh, is, uh, say, uh, a, finite, uh, a finite class of functions. Okay? Uh, given the time we have, I just want to uh, only uh, mention that, uh, basically, this is the, to be a bit provocative, this is the only case when we can um, by hand, I would say, work out uh, interesting uh, bounds on this quantity. However, the idea of covering numbers is to, s to see uh, how well, given a, a function class f, how well can we approximate our function class by a finite number of functions, okay? To reduce uh, the problem of controlling this general uh, Radmacher complexity to um, to the case of a finite function. If I do this, how much do I lose? Okay? Maybe it's interesting to know that the class F is very poor, it just contains one function, then the quantity is zero. So this quantity, yeah. this Radomach complex is a bound for overfitting, roughly spoken. So we can't overfit if we only have one function. If we have, um, for example, binary classification, we have only two labels, and uh, f contains all possible classifiers, then the quantity is uh, one or two. It is maximum. This will be. This would be one in this case. Yeah. And this can be seen directly because you can, uh, if you have all functions available, you can always make the product sigma i times f z i equal to one, and then the sum will be equal to n, so it's normalized by n. So the supremum will be equal to one always. Yeah, yeah. So w what Bruno is saying is uh, very, very true. Uh, so why uh, is, I mean, one way to see that this, uh, this quantity measures the, the richness, in a sense, of this uh, function class f, is you see that if f, uh, I mean, to be, to be extreme, suppose that the class f is all possible functions, okay? Of course, uh, regardless of the value of the, of the zi's, you can select in the supremum the function which is equal to sigma i on each uh, zi. And of course, 
you'll have a, you, you'll kind of align f with the, the signs, okay? The, and you always, you can, you'll be in a situation where you'll, you'll, uh, you'll be able to uh, match these two uh, functions. I mean, you, you'll be able to, to, to have this equal to sigma i, and since, uh, then in this case, uh, this sign times this sign is always one, and summing up and divided by n, you'll s have something here which does not tend to zero. Okay, so of course, as the sample. In a smaller remark, it is if the zi's are all diff different. So if you have continuous input space. Yeah, 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 of course. If, if the zi's are different, so that you can. Uh, yeah, 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 of course. So in a sense, uh, if f is restricted to a certain amount of functions, then you might not be able to, uh, in the supremum, each time match the, the sign. And in this case, you'll, you'll uh, hopefully uh, get something that scales uh, uh, sm uh, at a rate which is smaller than n, and this will tend to zero, okay? Uh, but we'll see, actually, that uh, Given reasonable uh, ways to measure how big f is, this guy tends to zero. Uh, r r okay, so let's uh, move on. So if I take q, a probability measure on s, uh, I call uh, I will call an epsilon net of uh, this class f. So in the space uh, L2 of Q. Okay, it's not a big deal if uh, this notation is uh, not familiar to you. This is just the space of square integrable functions with respect to Q. Uh, so an epsilon net of F in this space is, uh, is any collection G1 Gn of uh, functions, also of s uh, into uh, into r, okay, such that mm, so for all function f in this uh, in this class uh, f, there will exist a, a function. Uh, uh, there will exist a function in this finite collection such that. Okay, so there will always exist a function in this finite collection that approximates well any function in your class. So what does it mean? So on the drawing, if you suppose that f is, a, uh, simply speaking, this set, okay, what you're asking uh, for this uh, epsilon net is to be any collection of functions possibly outside of f, okay, such that, uh, the balls, okay, centered in these guys. Cover F, okay, because this can be understood as the distance from F or distance squared from uh, the point GI to F, okay, and this statement uh, is uh, uh, simply saying that the function F lies in uh, the ball centered in GI with radius uh, epsilon. So uh, you see that uh, we're asking, uh, so an epsilon net is any finite collection of functions that approximates well the, the whole class F, which is possibly, uh, of course, uh, non-finite. And the covering number uh, okay, so or the epsilon covering number, I should say, of f uh, in this, with respect to q in this space L2 is simply the smallest. Uh, so is there any better chalk? Can you find the better? Ah, uh, yeah, because maybe it's not. Uh, yeah, yeah, of it's course. Possible at all. I'm sure it's possible. Uh, I'm not sure this one is much better, but okay. I'll try to make it clearer. Uh, so. It's the smallest possible uh, cardinality of uh, G when G 
is an epsilon net. Okay, understood uh, of f in uh, L2 of q. Okay, so uh, it's simply the smallest possible number of such functions of uh, such that the, 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 the balls centered in these functions will uh, cover completely the set f. So again, this is a notion that makes sense in a more general setting. If you're in a metric space, uh, this makes sense. Uh, and what happens actually is that this, in a sense, is a, a correct, so not fully correct, but uh, I'll explain, touch a word on that, but it's a correct way to control, uh, it's a correct quantity to control this Radmacher complexity. So. Uh, So this follows sixty-seven. So it's a kind of uh, old result, or, of course, but uh, quite uh, still interesting. Uh, and uh, so, in the context of our problem, uh, this bound states that the Radmacher complexity of uh, the function, uh, the set, uh, the set F. Okay, is up to a universal constant, okay, smaller than one divided by square root of n. n is the sample size, remember, times the expectation of a certain integral. Okay, so the square root of what? Of the log of the covering number of the class. Uh, of the class F. D epsilon. Okay. So, uh, so why is there an expectation here? Because I just attract your attention on the fact that the probability measure towards, uh, with respect to which, sorry, uh, these covering numbers are measured in this, uh, this bound, it's with respect to the empirical distribution that is uh, uh, constructed from uh, our sample. So it's a pretty impressive result. Uh, that's, uh, and it's uh, actually uh, already uh, non-trivial. It says something already quite non-trivial if, if uh, so the expectation of this integral, okay, uh, is bounded, uh, so by a constant independent of m. Okay, suppose this is the case. If this uh, integral or the expectation of this integral, which is a, a number, which might be finite, uh, which might be infinite, sorry. Okay, it's, the bound might be vacuous. But if it's not, and in addition, if it's independent of n, then uh, this uh, quantity is guaranteed to tends to zero at the speed one divided by square root of n. Which uh, already, I mean, is a quite satisfactory uh, statement uh, because uh, remember that uh, this uh, Radmacher complexity controls the performance uh, of this guy. Uh, okay. Uh, I recall that, uh, so maybe I should uh, recall that this guy is an upper bound for uh, the expectation of uh, Okay. It's an upper bound for the performance of this uh, function f hat. Okay, so the next question now, and this is when uh, combinatorics uh, come into play, 
uh, of course is uh, I mean we need now to since we've already uh, identify the situation where this uh, leads to non-trivial uh, results, we need to understand a uh, situation in which this holds, okay? Uh, to identify uh, f function classes on which to perform empirical risk minimization and, and, which, and when we do, how, how good uh, does it uh, perform? So I just want to say that, I mean, we don't, or, or it's not necessary to do combinatorics uh, now to understand this quantity. Okay, there are, uh, there are some um, direct analysis which are possible. I just want to give two examples. Okay, so so direct, of course, uh, there's, a, there's some work to do, but I mean, by direct, I mean you don't need to do combinatorics. Uh, proves, for instance, that I mean, if you take f. Uh, to be any d-dimensional space of, uh, uh, d-dimensional vector space of functions, okay, in this case, the supremum, so, which is a pretty good news because, uh, um, well, I'll comment after, the supremum of this covering number with respect to any possible probability measure, okay, will be within uh, a constant, possibly depending on d, uh, epsilon to the power minus d. Okay, so you see uh, that, uh, I mean, it's already uh, a pretty interesting result because now you can, of course, replace Pn, if, if this is the case, you can replace Pn by any, by the supremum, uh, or you replace n by the supremum, take the log, okay? Obviously, this will be in integrable in zero. Okay, because you're going to have a log of 1 divided by epsilon times d. Uh, the integral, I attract your attention to the fact that it's actually, it doesn't go to plus infinity, it goes to, uh, uh, I mean, when, when you take epsilon to be too large, of course, you're going to have the covering number equal to 1, because you can convert with one ball. In this case, the log is 0. So basically, uh, in this situation, this guy is always finite, and this proves that uh, the Radmacher complexity goes to zero at least at the speed one divided by root n. So it's already a pretty interesting result. Uh, the second, uh, resu uh, second case, which is, uh, I would say, uh, very far from this one in the sense that uh, the complexity will be very uh, large, but if you take f to be the set of all, uh, so beta times continuously uh, differentiable functions f uh, defined on a d-dimensional cube. Okay, there are two factors in this definition, so the, the number of times you're differentiable here and the dimension on which you're defined. In this case, you have a similar uh, kind of result, which is that the supremum over O probability measure Q of this time the logarithm, so it's okay, will this time be uh, within a constant times epsilon to the power minus d divided by beta. Okay? Uh, okay? And in this case, uh, we can 
uh, run the same analysis that I did orally, uh, namely that um, this uh, integral, uh, I mean provided, so be careful here we have a log of n, so it is exactly the term which is here. And then if you take a square root, okay, if you want this to be integrable as a function of epsilon in zero, so uh, uh, it's uh, requiring uh, two beta to be larger than d, okay? If two beta is larger than d, uh, this implies that uh, Okay, so this is just for the in integrability of this function of epsilon, or the square root of this function, sorry, to be integrable at zero here, okay? So that this guy is a constant. And okay, so this is given by uh, heavy but direct analysis, which is not of combinatorial nature. Uh, and it's not extremely interesting uh, in statistics because, I mean, usually what you have, uh, I mean, you have good, uh, when you have good empirical evidence on the problem at hand, the, the nature of the functional class on which you want to perform empirical risk minimization is usually, uh, I mean, can be of uh, tricky nature and, and bounds like these ones might just miss uh, some structure of the class F and provide some very crude and uh, violent upper bounds which are not really uh, grasping the whole, uh, the, the, the complexity of the functional class. So now, uh, before uh, moving to, uh, maybe this is something I need to do, so. Yeah. So you. So you remember th that uh, the class uh, F is a is a family of functions defined on S, taking value zero one. So S can be arbitrary, okay, but the F can have a structure of vector space, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, but in this case, vector space, it's, it, it requires the image space to be also a vector space. Otherwise, you cannot have uh, functions in zero one. I just forgot about so, okay, so take this, okay? But uh, uh, in this case, you need to be careful to, about what you say, but uh, so S is arbitrary here, but F, I can ask something about. Okay, so refined analysis shows Okay, uh, so coming back to the performance of uh, empirical risk minimization, that actually, so we, we've seen so far that uh, this performance of F hat is controlled by the Radmacher complexity of uh, the class F here. But actually it happens that this analysis, this upper bound, can be done on, uh, in a refined way or when you're looking at uh, kind of uh, uh, you can do this at different scales of uh, the problem and use this uh, relationship between this performance quantity, performance uh, measurement and this Radmacher complexity. You can perform this in a stage-wise manner uh, to actually show that the following result. So there are two uh, regimes. So if you suppose that Okay, if I uh, suppose that for all epsilon and all n, uh, the covering number of my class F uh, behaves like uh, epsilon to the power minus d. Okay, you can actually improve 
the upper bound that we obtain directly here, okay, by upper bounding this guy by the red micro complexity, you can actually improve it a lot. by showing that actually it behaves like, so D, uh, the parameter which appears here in the control of the covering number, times log n divided by n. Um, so you see, uh, this is a big improvement over one divided by square root of n. And uh, so there are discussions uh, about optimality here, which uh, reveal that in some scenarios, uh, the factor log n, which for other algorith al algorithmic uh, procedures other than uh, uh, empirical risk minimi minimization, sometimes are able to remove this log n, but I mean, uh, this level is not a, a big deal. Okay, so this is the first result, and uh, the same analysis uh, performed on bigger classes. reveals now that if mm, okay so if you have the same a kind of uh, control but of, on the logarithm of the covering number so this allows for much more complex uh, classes as the ones uh, discussed here for instance uh, in this case the same quantity as uh, over there the performance of the empirical risk minimizer performs as uh, so it's bounded by 1 divided by n to the power 2 divided by 2 plus d uh, sorry, and I have to impose that in this case that uh, the parameter d is between 0 and 2. So in this case, uh, you can easily convince yourself that because d is uh, smaller than 2, this again is uh, negligible with respect to square root of n. So in these two scenarios, uh, empirical risk minimization uh, does, uh, I mean, does a pretty good job. And in this case, um, I am not aware of any algorithm which outputs a function in f and that uh, does a better job. Okay, I'm not aware of uh, any algorithm in this situation for very complex classes. Okay. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, discussion for simple classes, and this is the, actually the only case which is interesting in practice. Okay, so uh, now I want to talk about finally talk about combinatorial questions. Um, which uh, actually relate to the question, how can we compute uh, these covering numbers? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, what is uh, the class of functions that uh, I'm just, uh, I just suppose that they satisfy this requirement. Uh, so here was just an example, sorry. So this is an example I stop. And, uh, and I give two examples. So in the case where if f is d-dimensional, this is true. Okay. Uh, and I say now if f is the family of... Okay. And now uh, I mean, uh, now I close the example here. And I say that a refined analysis of what I, I discussed before shows that if this is true, for instance, if this is... Uh, okay. If this is true, then, yeah, thanks for precising. 
so under this assumption, okay, uh, then this is true. But you see that uh, there's something important here is that I'm supposing that this holds. This is a, a random quantity on the right hand side, the discovering number, because it depends on the, the probability measure Pn. Uh, I'm asking this to hold uniformly for all n. And on the right hand side, I'm asking the bound to be uh, non uh, deterministic. Okay, so now, uh, before uh, relating um, uh, the, the problem of controlling covering numbers uh, with uh, any com combinatorial uh, notion, I need to define uh, something. Uh, and of course, uh, in this talk, I'm not assuming anyone to be uh, f familiar with the, uh, the theory of uh, Vapnik and Chervoninki, so I will just uh, recall some basic uh, notions of the theory. And the general goal, the general goal of course, uh, is uh, to assess the the combinatorial complexity in a sense or structure of families of uh, of sets so how can we do uh, such a uh, thing so again, I apologize if this is very, uh, if for some of you this is very classic. But uh, I mean, I'm assuming in this talk that I'm talking to uh, people unfamiliar with the subject. Uh, so, so suppose you take a set E. Okay, which will not be exactly uh, the set S that we consider so far, not necessarily. Uh, and you take points, or you take B, uh, a finite number of points in E, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, before introducing this, I take uh, C, uh, a collection of uh, subset C included in E. Okay? So I have a, a set C, a set E, sorry. And I, I, I consider a family of. Uh, of uh, subsets, so say uh, the, the the family of all disks, okay, in E. Why not? Okay. Uh, so now to assess the uh, a way. Uh, so this is the way that was uh, proposed by Vatnik and Chervonenkis to uh, assess the combinatorial structure of this family of sets C. Is to do the following. So you fix B a finite number of points. Okay, and now we can uh, erase borders, probably it's easier. And the question that we can ask is, uh, so if I give you a finite number of points, okay, how many uh, of the subsets of this finite collection of points can I uh, realize or can I catch with intersections with the uh, sets in the class C. Okay? So, uh, I mean, is there, if you take, uh, if you take the family of circles, okay, or sorry, the, of, the, of disks, okay, in the plane, uh, is it possible with, uh, with disks to uh, catch any possible subset of uh, this family of points here? For instance, if I isolate these three points, can a circle uh, uh, can a disk, sorry, cover these three points without covering any of the two points here? So this is uh, the kind of uh, way, um, the question that we're asking. Uh, so a way to formalize this question is to, to say, okay, so I'm going to consider what is called the trace of this family of sets C on B. Uh, okay, by, uh, as, and define it as the family of uh, 
C intersected with B, or C in this family uh, of C. Okay, so these are exactly the family of subsets of B that I can catch uh, by intersected, uh, intersecting B with sets in C. So obviously, uh, I mean by, by construction, I mean the, the best uh, you can do is uh, of course catch all the guys, uh, all the subsets of B and in this case, you, uh, this uh, trace is always ca has cardinality uh, smaller than two to the power uh, number of points in B, okay, which is the number of subsets of B. Uh, and uh, whenever uh, C, uh, sorry, whenever this uh, is an equality, we say that uh, that uh, C shatters shatters B. Okay, and what is called the VC dimension of uh, the family C, okay, it's defined as uh, the supremum of n larger than 1 for which there exists some B with B of cardinality n such that uh, B is shattered by C. Okay? It's not an easy definition to, to grasp, but uh, uh, it's a pretty natural way, as you saw, that to, uh, to see how rich is the class C. I mean, the more sets you allow in, in the class C, the more uh, refined patterns of finite points you'll be able to grasp by intersections. Okay? So, uh, very classical examples. So, uh, so, of course, this uh, allows, I mean, it's possible to be uh, to have an infinite VC dimension if the class C is uh, too complex. So uh, examples include the foreign. I mean, if you take uh, so the set E on which uh, we're doing all this business is the, the Euclidean plane. And if you take all disks, C uh, all disks in, uh, in E, uh, so the VC dimension of C will be uh, 2, 3, sorry. All right, uh, so more, uh, more examples. So if you take uh, axis aligned uh, rectangles, okay, so these are the guys uh, which are like this. Uh, with uh, arbitrary height and, and, and width. Uh, then Vc of C is going to be equal to 4. Okay, so let's try to do this example uh, to see why this is the case, to get familiarized with this notion of uh, Batnik Chavodenki's dimension. Yeah. Uh, is this the end already? Okay, uh, okay, I'll need uh, 15 minutes, is that okay? Um, or 10, I mean, uh, tell me just what time I have and... Well, it's like minus 10, but if you can... Okay, okay, uh, I'll try to, to finish in a reasonable time. Okay, so, uh, so I invite you to try and uh, show that this is the case, that the VC dimension of uh, family of axis uh, aligned rectangles is equal to 4. Uh, okay, so there's much more interesting examples, but what I want to say, and maybe uh, uh, so what I want to say to go straight to the point is uh, the theorem due to Hausler during 94, showing that, uh, I mean, this thing, which looks pretty unrelated to the business we've been discussing so far, actually is uh, quite related 
Uh, and the result is actually that if you take uh, the supremum of the covering number, uh, so supremum with respect to any probability distribution of the covering number of f in L2 of q, well, this is actually uh, smaller or equal. Here, all constants uh, are explicit. Small than v plus 1, e to the power of v plus 1. So e is just uh, exponential, or exponential v plus 1. Uh, times 2 divided by epsilon divided by 2v if v is equal to the vc dimension of uh, f plus. Okay, so what is f plus? So you see that the vc dimension has been defined for family of sets. Okay, so uh, a priori it has nothing to do with family of functions. Uh, and f plus is, um, is a family of sets, it's the family of subgraphs of uh, functions in f. So it's uh, subgraphs of f, and more precisely is the family of all, uh, so x, t, uh, such that f of x is larger than t for f in the class f. Okay, so you see this is a family of sets uh, in uh, R, in S, sorry, times, uh, so I suppose functions are bounded by 0, 1. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, this definition, I mean, this is well defined, uh, and of course, if this is finite. So it's a pretty remarkable result uh, showing that uh, the combinatorial complexity of the subgraphs of uh, uh, family of functions control this, uh, this notion okay, of complexity, which is of quite unrelated nature. So uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is uh, quite interesting also if I have a few minutes, is uh, the notion of combinatorial dimension. So uh, the whole point of combinatorial dimension, maybe I'll just define this object and uh, I will not state results involving this object. Uh, so this is a, So this is a strategy or this is a result that is very well suited when the functions in f are actually 0, 1 valued. Uh, actually, we can show that it's not, I mean, in some respects, it's not optimal and uh, it's a bit uh, suboptimal uh, for arbitrary classes of functions. And um, the notion of combinatorial dimension actually uh, is something that is, uh, can be understood as an analog of VC dimension for the family of sets, but for the family of functions. Okay, let me just give the, the definition because I believe it's an interesting object. Uh, and we'll see that it actually boils down to VC dimension when we consider zero one valued functions. So the definition of epsilon shattering, which uh, is a notion which is valid for functions. So uh, if you consider any finite subset uh, included in S, uh, so remember that we're considering functions S in zero one. So for B included in S and, and H Uh, take, uh, taking, uh, defined on this finite set B. Uh, we say that the, the pair H uh, or BH 
is epsilon shattered by the class F uh, if for any uh, subset of B, A, there exists some F such that the following holds. F of X is smaller than H of X for X in A. And f of x is larger than h of x plus epsilon for x in uh, b uh, set minus a. So it's not uh, it's a kind of a complicated definition, but on the drawing it's very clear. So what is what are we asking? So if, if here you picture S, here you picture uh, R, say, and you represent B as a finite collection of points, okay? So these are the points B. And I take, uh, so remember that H is defined on this finite uh, number of points, so H is something that we define this way. Okay, so if I uh, connect these dots, okay, like this. Uh, so if this is uh, represent H, and if I represent here H plus epsilon, okay, so this is uh, H plus epsilon. Uh, the fact that B H is epsilon shattered by F, I mean, this complicated definition means that. If I select any collection of points here, for instance, this one, this one, and uh, that's it. This is A, okay? Uh, I'm asking uh, that there exists a function f, which uh, is lower than these two points here, uh, and above these two points here, okay? I'm going to maybe put this point a bit on the side for the drawing. So I'm asking the, that there exists some function so on, on A, which is lower than H. So here I have to be lower than A. Here I have to be lower than A. But here I have to be above. And here I have to be above. So I'm asking uh, to be like this. Uh, yeah, and here above. OK. <coughs> Okay, so this is a way, uh, and now if you take this, uh, if you ask, uh, I mean, just to uh, finish with this, okay, what is called, uh, so it's, it's usually denoted this way, okay, with a, a factor epsilon to define, uh, this is called the epsilon, uh, epsilon uh, combinatorial dimension, is uh, simply the supremum of the cardinal of B, such that there exists some H uh, uh, such that BH is epsilon shattered by F. Okay, uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that uh, and I promise this is the last thing I will write. Okay. Uh, so why is this uh, satisfactory generalization of, um, of VC dimension? If you consider F to be a collection of indicative functions uh, of sets in a class C, then you can show that the combinatorial dimension of F epsilon is exactly equal to the Vapnik Chavonenki's dimension of F for epsilon smaller than one. And uh, relating to uh, what we said with this uh, notion of uh, complexity here, uh, actually it, it grasps much more the complexity of F than this, uh, this quantity over there, because you can show that VC of F plus, so this uh, 
vc dimension of the subgraphs is exactly the supremum for epsilon positive of uh, okay so i'll end with this uh, this result uh, just saying that uh, uh, at least uh, i am very interested in this topic and how it relates to uh, learning theory and I hope uh, that you have learned at least a few stuff. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Well, all the time is but if there's one urgent question, then... So, okay, then let's move the questions offline. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks a lot.